but we're going to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining Palmer Land Conservancy at our spring conservation update. I'm Astrid, Palmer's event and membership manager, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to Palmer's first ever virtual event. Uh, before we delve into any of our exciting updates that we have planned for this afternoon, I would like to extend a thank you to each and every one of you for being here today, whether you're a longtime supporter of Palmer or this is your first time joining us at an event. Thank you so much for being here. You being here signifies your commitment to the land and water in Colorado. So thank you. Today, Rebecca Jewett, Christy Nackard, and Steve Harris will talk to us about conservation. They'll talk about current projects, recent successes, emerging issues, and ways that you can get involved. During the event, I wanna encourage you to ask questions. There is a little Q&A chat box that you can enter any questions that come up. At the very end of our program, we'll spend a few minutes talking or discussing some of those questions. With that, I'd like to enter, introduce Christy, or excuse me, I'd like to introduce Rebecca Jewett, Palmer's president and CEO, to talk a little bit more about Palmer's work. Thank you, Astrid, and thank you all for being here. It is wonderful to have you today. Uh, we have a handful of updates today that I'm excited to go through um, some emerging work and, and we'll share some behind the scenes information. But first, for those of you who might be new to Palmer, I want to just first share a, a tiny bit about us. We've been around since the late 70s, and in that time, we've been committed to land and water conservation. Our mission is to protect land and water for the well-being of nature and people, and we do this throughout southern Colorado and even beyond. We envision that the health, recreation, and spiritual benefits of nature are available to everyone. We know that land and water are so important to our quality of life, and it's really a part of all of our day-to-day -day lives. And that's what energizes us every day to get up and do this important and um, rewarding work um, with you all in partnership. We have uh, four strategic priorities right now guided by our strategic plan. Those include land for nature, and we can go ahead and go to the next slide, perfect. All of our projects fit into one of these buckets, water for life, land for nature, land for people, and land for food. The, these guiding priorities um, are our North Star as we determine what are important projects to take on, what do we need to be spending our time and energy moving forward? And uh, for those who are more interested, our strategic plan is on the website. But these themes really guide all of our work. And you'll see this through uh, the updates and the projects that we talk about today. OK, you can go to the next slide. So I'm so excited to give a handful of uh, behind the scenes updates on our emerging work, current work that's going on right now. The first is called Avenger Open Space. This is the city of Woodland Park's newest public gem. Now, of course, it's not open yet because this is still in the process of uh, becoming publicly accessible. But with the help of Great Outdoors Colorado funding, the city of Woodland Park was able to acquire this beautiful property. Uh, and this truly just happened in the last couple of months. It's 120 acres big, and it is the largest ever land acquisition done by the city of Woodland Park. In addition to the GOCO grant, it was made possible um, with city funds from the city of Woodland Park and private donations. We're especially excited about this project because despite Woodland Park having this amazing backdrop with um, the National Forest, there's actually very little accessibility into um, natural areas from the city. So this parcel at 120 acres provides a wonderful opportunity once all the planning's done and it's open to the public, for the public to, to have more um, accessible ways to get into nature. This is actually nestled in between, like right on the border with El Paso and Teller counties. Um, and it's completely surrounded by the Pike National Forest. So it also contributes to an amazing uh, protected landscape. Without this protection, um, this area certainly could have been uh, purchased and developed for any number of different uses. And we are so thrilled to be partnering with the city of Woodland Park. 
um, we have come in as their conservation partner. So as they are acquiring this, we are working hand in hand with them to ensure that this property is preserved forever. Uh, so we will be holding a perpetual conservation easement on this property and we'll be working alongside them to ensure the conservation values are protected for the public forever. Um, it is in a pristine landscape of pine and aspen forests. There are some meadows and grassy knolls. And what's most spectacular are the breathtaking views of Pikes Peak um, and the far distant Sangre de Cristo ranges on a clear day you can see as well. So when this uh, protection is completely done and the planning has been finished, we are excited to welcome you out to this property to explore this incredible gem um, spearheaded by the city of Woodland Park. And we're just thrilled to call them a partner. Okay, we can go to the next slide. The next project I want to talk about is um, the very big initiative, and there's been a fair bit of press coverage about it. I hope some of you have seen the articles. This is, you know, we've been around since the late 70s. We have done, um, we have an incredible roster of projects, but when I say this is a once in a generation initiative, I really mean that, and I mean that from the perspective of even an incredible 40 year track record at Palmer. It's once in a generation, and I'll get into the details in a minute, due to its scale, the unique partnership, and the impact to the community that we are all going to see as this project unfolds. So what SOAR is, first of all, it stands for Security, Open Space, and Agricultural Resiliency. And what it is, is it's a unique partnership between three military bases and three conservation organizations. The three bases include the Air Force Academy, Schriever Space Force Base, and Fort Carson. And the conservation partners include Palmer as the local partner in this effort. This is all happening in our backyard in El Paso County. And we are partnering with the Nature Conservancy, who is bringing incredible global horsepower to this initiative, and the Trust for Public Land, a well-known national entity who we always love partnering with. Together, all three of us has, have forged this partnership with the Department of Defense to help protect military bases, but with a unique spin, using conservation tools to do it. So as development and growth has happened in El Paso County, um, when bases once had plenty of room around them, plenty of buffer, we are starting to see encroachment. And for the military, keeping an open space buffer is incredibly important for national security reasons uh, and to provide them the latitude to do what they need to do, of course, to ensure national security. So around each of these bases, we have identified a conservation buffer chosen with, um, with the military and using um, what's important for them as well as what's important for us to identify these boundaries. Um, all in with these three different military bases, we're looking at conservation of 80,000 acres in El Paso County. That's a tremendous scale. For reference, we've been around since the late 70s, we've permanently protected 140,000 acres. So what we're proposing to do in this initiative over the next five to 10 years is to protect 80,000 acres, um, which just for that scale, it took us 45 years to do 140,000 acres, 80,000 acres we are proposing to do in five to 10 years. It's simply a tremendous scale and it is true landscape level conservation. What is also exciting about this, besides the core um, goal of protecting the military bases, um, achieving some incredible conservation outcomes, but even beyond the strict on the ground conservation outcomes, there is a, um, a whole plethora of other community outcomes and impacts to this project. And it's really this incredible list of positive outcomes that gets all of us really excited. So we have the national security component, great. We have landscape scale conservation, amazing. We also have outcomes that could include publicly accessible properties. As we are looking at these buffer areas, there are a number of opportunities to have um, the conservation goal actually be a public open space where the public will be able to get on the land. 
Because a lot of what the military is concerned about is, um, say, development encroachment, but having a public open space is actually fine, and they love that. So we are looking at opportunities to increase the number of publicly accessible properties in El Paso County through this project. We are seeing tremendous wildlife habitat protection through this project. One of the main properties that we are seeking to conserve is actually a 48,000 acre ranch that is east of Colorado Springs. And it's one of the main flyover training areas for the Air Force Academy for cadets as they are learning, um, uh, doing their flight trainings. That scale of shortgrass prairie, which is one of the most imperiled ecosystems globally, is tremendous. And the wildlife protection, the ecological protection seen on that scale is, is truly something that doesn't happen every day. Finally, as we are looking at these properties and we have nature protection, we have public open space, there are going to be a few opportunities where we can actually look at auxiliary benefits, such as things even like affordable housing. When we're looking at an entire parcel, and maybe half of it is really important for conservation, but the other half, we actually could potentially um, uh, implement things like low density affordable housing, which is a really important issue for the military as well. And so as we look at these priority buffer areas, the highest priority for conservation we are absolutely pursuing with conservation objectives but if there's an opportunity where it's just it's not quite as high on the conservation scale we're looking at other outcomes that can also positively impact our community and expanding our community partnerships to achieve that so we're at the very beginning of this initiative like i said five to ten years at minimum um, this initiative includes dozens and dozens of individual conservation transactions to actually get this done so you'll be hearing a lot more about this but we are so thrilled to be partnering with the nature conservancy and trust for public land and so thrilled to be able to see um, and be initiating this level of conservation here in our very own community so let's go to the um, the next slide. So finally, I wanted to share um, a very exciting emerging program for us. We have been working with farms and protecting valuable water supplies for 10 years. And that work has really shown us that we need to scale this work. Um, that project, as many of you know, is in Eastern Pueblo County and it's called the Bessemer Project. We've been talking about it for a long time and it's an incredibly important effort. We are taking the Bessemer Project and we're expanding it and looking beyond Pueblo County at where we can put our tools, our expertise, our partnerships to work to do more really good work with water and with farming communities. So some of what this looks like is we're building a water program and in it include two key strategies. So the first is to protect and conserve farm ground that still has valuable water rights and working one on one with farmers and farming families to protect their land and water if that's a good fit for them. But the second is to get involved in areas where there may already be a purchase of water rights and to help navigate a positive outcome that still protects farms and puts farming um, as a priority in our region, but helps to navigate the reality of a water short world and to help facilitate positive outcomes that still include water also potentially going to growing cities creating water sharing solutions in short. That's a lot of what our Bessemer work has been, but we're finding opportunities to do that in other places as well. We have an emerging project in Bent County uh, where we're partnering with the farming community, um, with the local government there, and with a um, municipal interest to see if we can, like we've done and like we are doing with Bessemer, come up with these positive water sharing solutions that do provide win-wins for agriculture and also for cities. Um, so a lot more to come on that. It's uh, the program is really emerging and we are excited at the opportunity because as we all know, water is our number one natural resource issue in um, not only Southern Colorado, but greater Colorado and even throughout uh, the Western US. All right, you can go to the next slide. So, 
that's those are the updates those are the uh, project updates and i wanted to just take a minute to look ahead at what is to come we so a couple of years ago in the pandemic we led an initiative called elevate the peak and through that work we heard from over 1200 people across the pikes peak region and we asked them what's important to you about conservation where do we need to, need to be focusing our efforts as we move forward what we heard was loud and clear one, we are losing the race with conservation and conservation cannot wait. We need to put it as a top priority in our region. And the second is that statement is really rooted in deep, deep concerns about population growth, but more importantly, losing the way of life that we all love. So how do we put conservation first and foremost in, in the eyes of our community? How do we ensure that it is a priority um, for our regions as they continue to grow. We know growth is inevitable and we are not anti-growth. We love that more people want to come and um, live in this beautiful place that we all call home. But how do we do that and also not risk losing what we all love? That is really our North Star for Palmer. You can go to the next slide. So part of our, as we look to the future and as we think about conservation as a priority and what our five-year strategic plan outlines are very bold and even audacious goals. We listen to you. Conservation cannot wait. There is an urgency. We need to act now. So in that strategic plan, I just want to highlight two very big goals um, uh, for you to also know uh, what's driving us. The first is on the ground conservation. And we have a bold goal of getting to 200,000 acres of permanently protected land here in our region over the next five years. As I said, we're already at 140,000 acres. So this is roughly a 50% increase to get to 200,000 acres. But alongside that, it is not just enough to do on the ground conservation because people ultimately get this work done. People will continue this work. People have to care. And that's why we're also focused on our community and growing our membership of devoted conservationists. So we have a goal of growing to 2000 members over the next five years. We're currently at about 500. So that is an incredibly goal, bold goal but we know it's possible because we know people love this work as much as we do. So thank you for everything you're doing to propel conservation forward. You truly do make our work possible. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over uh, back to Astrid to, to move on with the webinar. Thank you. Rebecca, thank you so much for that overview on Palmer. And you're absolutely right. It's people that make this work possible. With that, I would like to introduce Christy Knackard to talk about Marisol, Looking at the Sun, a film presented and produced by Palmer Land Conservancy as a way to mobilize communities around conservation. Hi, everyone. Yes, I'm Christy Knackard. I am Vice President of External Affairs at Palmer. I am zooming in from Salida. We have a little office up here. Uh, I'm really excited to introduce Mirasol, our new film. This film is a, a beautiful documentary featuring the Italian and Hispanic multi-generational farming community in Pueblo that's fighting to protect its land and water, and in turn, its culture and livelihood. Um, as Rebecca has shared, you know, Palmer has long wanted to amplify our story and the critical work that we are doing, specifically in Pueblo as part of our Bessemer project. We've been working down there for nearly 10 years now in the face of an impending dry up of some of the most fertile and beautiful farmland, not only in Southern Colorado, but Colorado at large and home to the Pueblo Chile. And so two years ago, a very special opportunity came about, a very unique one, um, to partner with an award-winning filmmaker by the name of Ben Knight, who has directed incredible films in partnership with brands like Patagonia, Yeti, The North Face. Um, he does this phenomenal job of weaving together these raw human stories with the beauty of the natural world. And so when he said yes to us, to our project, we couldn't believe it. It was an incredible opportunity. And so the film itself has been a project we've been working on for nearly two years. And just last week, we premiered to the Pueblo community. It was a gift for them. It was to a sold out crowd of over 400 people. And we're just getting started on this project. 
But essentially, in short, Mirror Soul explores how rural agricultural communities and the food they put on our tables, it's threatened. It's threatened by rapid development, population growth, climate change, competing economies. And the film itself, it challenges us, it challenges us to consider what's at stake and whether we're willing to take action to protect it. And so um, if you could just go back one slide, Astrid, before I share a short clip, it's gonna be a 30 second clip. I wanted to share a little bit about why Marisol, why we chose to do this at this time, why now? So nationally, we're losing 2000 acres every day. And we know this, especially as Coloradans, water is a, is a finite resource. It's an essential one. And for farmers, it's everything. And it is the water is the natural resource issue of our time. But what we what we found is, and we're seeing nationally, is conservation. It's not top of mind. We get it. There are so many social issues facing us as individuals and as communities. And yet, as Rebecca shared, for the environment, we're losing this race. We need more people mobilized and activated on behalf of agriculture and water and conservation. So we have three goals with this film. It's to ignite a culture shift for conservation where people are mobilized to not only know, but to care and actually act on behalf of the land and water. We want to amplify the scale, pace, and importance of this work with our on-the-ground conservation work around policy. And three, it's also to celebrate the land people and produce of Pueblo, which this film does a remarkable job doing. So without further ado, I would love to share this 30-second trailer. So it takes us just a second to get it up on the screen. And as Astrid is doing that maneuvering, um, the, there is a longer trailer, a two and a half minute trailer that you can watch on our film website, which is mirasolfilm.com. But don't do that now. Wait for us after this webinar. The land is sacred. And the land feeds us. And the water nourishes us. That's how sacred it is. To realize that uh, by the work of your hands you shall eat. Huh? And it's, it, that's reality. And we have to honor that. Thank you, Astrid. Um, Astrid, we can see if you just want to go back to the slide deck. So we have a beautiful 36 minute film. Now what? What do we do with the film? It's really what happens after the fact. So Palmer has developed a very comprehensive impact campaign to shepherd this film to ensure that it's seen as many as seen it's seen by as many people as possible. As I shared, it was um, it premiered last week to Pueblo. It will premiere in Colorado Springs. Next slide on May 21st. And we're in the process of planning a lot of events for the next year. Um, our, our campaign also includes a film festival strategy. The film has already been nominated for a really prestigious award at the Big Sky Documentary Film Festival in Montana. Just over this weekend, I was at Five Point Film Festival in Carbondale, where it screened to over 400 people. It's been so well received. We'll be at Mountain Film Festival and Telluride over Memorial Day weekend. And eventually our campaign is going to include a whole distribution effort and partnership with hopefully academic institutions, our high schools, our universities, and ultimately it's going to be available online for free for everyone next starting next summer, likely in 2025. First, it's an opportunity for Palmer to host events and really help people connect the dots to this story and the importance of conservation work and how they can get involved. But in short, the people and the media, they're starting to pick it up. It's gathering a lot of interest. And so we really believe that conservation is truly a solution to many of our community challenges. And we really want Mirasol to be seen as with, seen by as many people as possible. And again, while it shines, this story shines a spotlight on Pueblo, this is actually Colorado's story. This is a national story, one that all rural communities are facing. And so ultimately we want people to feel inspired and activated to get involved. Because as we are often saying around here at Palmer, to love a place is truly only the beginning. It takes courage and collective will to protect it. So as I said, you can learn more there. There's our link to our website, that QR code. If you hold up your phone right now, that should take you right there to learn more about the film. I hope 
I hope you'll consider joining us at one of our upcoming events. These are just the May listings. We have a lot more planned throughout the summer and more on the horizon. If you'd like to get involved with the film campaign, we have a lot of really exciting opportunities. So please contact me. Um, and of course, at the end of this, if you have any questions, please pop them into the chat. And with that, I'll pass the mic back to Astrid. Thank you, Christy. And yes, we have lots of Marisol events coming up. Like I said, just stay connected to our uh, website. We'll be updating that uh, very soon. Switching gears, I would like to introduce Steve Harris, Palmer's Stewardship Director, to talk to us about e-bikes. Thank you very much, Astrid. And hello, everyone. I am Steve Harris, the Land Stewardship Director here at Palmer. And that means our department, the, my team, is responsible for taking care of the properties that are already in our portfolio. And our property portfolio today sits at right around 138,000 acres of land spread across 10 counties in Colorado, ranging from Park County in the Northwest down to Los Animas County in the South, Otero and Crowley counties to the East and everywhere in between those boundaries. Uh, we monitor as of right now, 148 total properties. And most of those are privately owned properties, but we do have conservation easements on about 20 public properties spread throughout uh, Colorado Springs, El Paso County, uh, Manitou Springs, and we do have one property in Teller County. Um, so some of our most iconic uh, local open spaces and parks are encumbered by conservation easements, including Red Rock Canyon open space, Stratton open space, Bear Creek Regional Park, the Pineries open space in Black Forest, and Red Mountain open space in Manitou Springs, just to name a few. So as I mentioned, almost all the lands in our portfolio are encumbered by conservation easements, uh, which means that uh, we have a legal obligation uh, to enforce the terms of the conservation easement in perpetuity forever. Uh, we strictly construe the terms that were negotiated when the easement was placed upon these properties uh, because there are consequences if we don't do our job correctly. Uh, most importantly, uh, we are subject to uh, review from the IRS because we are a charitable 501c3 nonprofit organization. And so that's something we take very seriously. We are also accredited by the Land Trust Alliance. And so as a result of all of these requirements, uh, we, interpret, we interpret our easements very uh, conservatively. So turning to e-bikes, as you see there on the screen in front of you, uh, what is an e-bike? There is a commonly accepted definition of an e-bike. Uh, it's a vehicle with two or three wheels, uh, operable pedals, and a motor that does not exceed 750 watts of power. So that's the basic parameter that we're working with. And then beyond that, there are really three um, um, recognized types of e-bikes that you'll hear about. Uh, they're divided into class one, class two, and class three. So class one e-bikes are what we call pedal assist e-bikes, meaning that the motors don't run unless you are pedaling. Um, and those are designed so that they do not exceed 20 miles per hour when uh, the motor is running. Um, secondly, we have class two e-bikes. Those have pedals, but you do not have to be pedaling in order to engage the motor. It's more of a throttle-based system, uh, but those are also designed to go a maximum of 20 miles per hour. And then we have class three e-bikes, which are pretty much the same thing as class one e-bikes, except their design parameter is to go up to 28 miles per hour. Um, I will say that uh, in all the research I've done about e-bikes over the last year, um, I will tell you that e-bikes are coming and they're already here. They are the wave of the future. Um, you may have heard recently that Governor Polis um, uh, announced a $450 tax credit available to any resident of Colorado who wants to purchase an e-bike. Um, and so I also understand that now e-bikes are outselling regular analog bikes. Um, so they're here and uh, we are going to be dealing with them for the foreseeable future. And um, that's why we're looking into these issues now. Um, I would say that there are so many great things about e-bikes. First of all, they're a great alternative to driving a fossil fuel-based uh, car to work every day. So they're a great commuter option, and they also allow more people than ever to access some of our recreational areas. So those are a lot of, of good things about e-bikes. Uh, but there are some thornier issues 
um, when we talk about allowing e-bikes on natural areas, on natural surface trails, and just other places where currently mountain bikes are allowed. So as I mentioned, we hold easements on about 20 public properties. Um, six of our nine Colorado Springs easements do prohibit motorized vehicles. Um, all seven of our easements in El Paso County prohibit motorized vehicles, and all three of our easements in Manatee Springs uh, prohibit motorized vehicles. And I just, as an aside, I just want to note that um, as the community discusses and, and uh, tries to come to a consensus about e-bikes, another critical piece of this is the city's Trails Open Space and Parks Ordinance, which, as you may know, has been so effective uh, since 1997 at protecting open spaces and providing many, many uh, trail opportunities and parks. Uh, but the TOPS ordinance itself also prohibits motorized use. Uh, so the city of Colorado Springs is also looking into these issues very closely. And uh, it's not true that, um, so some of our conserved properties where we hold a conservation easement happen to be also TOPS properties, uh, but not all of them. And of course, not all of the TOPS properties have conservation easements. Um, so it's kind of a really a thicket of regulations that we have to, to look at when we're just trying to decide how to proceed. So what is Palmer's current position on e-bikes? Well, our current position is that uh, it's very conservative. As I stated before, that's our obligation. Uh, we take it very seriously to enforce the terms of the easement. So our current position is that any easement on which motorized vehicles are prohibited uh, does not allow uh, uh, e-bikes because they do have a motor. Um, and so therefore that is, that's where we come down to. And I frankly have done a lot of research into this issue and I've never seen any other land trust in the United States that has come to a contrary conclusion. So that's the starting point for um, assessing the e-bikes. And I know that the city is also undergoing a similar process looking at the TOPS ordinance and, and what can be done maybe to, to allow e-bikes where they are currently prohibited. In our case, um, there is one possibility and it is possible to amend conservation easements. We do not like to do this because the whole concept of a conservation easement is that it is something that is agreed to and once that document is recorded in the official records of the county, where the property is located, it is something that stays in force forever, as I said, in perpetuity. And so as a general rule, we really do not want to amend conservation easements. However, it is possible to amend the conservation easement. And I know at least El Paso County has expressed interest in amending um, some or one or more of their conservation easements to allow e-bike use. Uh, we have not received any formal request to date but it would not surprise me if we do uh, receive those requests. And once we do receive the request, then it goes through a formal process where we decide whether or not uh, the amendment is warranted. And that process would ultimately include our board of trustees here at Palmer um, voting to approve or deny a proposed amendment. And it also includes uh, potentially for some of these properties, the Great Outdoors Colorado board might have to approve it because uh, if, if GoPro provided funding for an easement. Um, but it, there is a process for doing it. And at the minimum, we have to show that there's a neutral effect to the conservation values that we're protecting through these easements. Um, and we would ideally like to see the conservation values enhanced. Um, but again, we haven't received any requests to date, so uh, we're not to that point quite yet. However, I'll go ahead and say, what would an amendment look like? Well, that is the $100,000 question. Um, it's a very big challenge uh, trying to figure out how could we amend an easement, uh, both to permit something like e-bike use, uh, but to make sure that we're not opening a Pandora's box of other issues to come down in the future. Um, what would we allow? Would it be class one e-bikes? Would it be class one and two or class one and three? Uh, where would these e-bikes be allowed? Uh, there is a lot of, of issues out there, and uh, we need to really look at this seriously before we make any decisions. And as again, as I said, this is not just a political decision for Palmer. It's not that we are in favor or against e-bikes. We really have to look at the legal terms of the conservation easements that we are charged with enforcing. 
Um, in contrast, another place like maybe Palmer Park in the city, well, that's a park that is not encumbered by a conservation easement. Um, it's not a tops property. And so really the city has a lot of discretion on that property, unlike some of the other properties where uh, these other legal constraints are in place. So threading the needle on these issues involves answering a lot of difficult questions. Um, of first and most importantly for Palmer is uh, uh, environmental impacts, impacts to the conservation values. There are studies out there that indicate that uh, e-bikes cause any greater environmental impacts than that. so that's good. Uh, but it's something that we take seriously and we need definitely um, make sure that we would be looking into as we consider any amendments. Uh, recreational conflicts are also uh, potentially an issue. Um, you know, we have multi-user trails where we have equestrians and hikers and mountain bikers and making sure that uh, everyone understands the proper trail etiquette will be important uh, because there is a possibility of user conflicts. And in fact, e-bikes have the potential to really bring in uh, maybe some more inexperienced mountain bikers who might not uh, really understand what they're getting into when they get on some of the more technical trails. Uh, we also have interesting questions about interjurisdictional connections. Um, many of our trails don't just stay within one jurisdiction. Um, you'll find trails that go from Manitou Springs to Colorado Springs to El Paso County and any variation of that. And we don't want to have a situation where someone is lawfully riding an e-bike on one property only to suddenly find out that they've just crossed an uh, uh, invisible border and suddenly they're on a property where it's not allowed. So those issues need to be looked at as well. Um, and a big concern for us is enforceability. Uh, we know our land managers and our government partners are under uh, resourced, understaffed. Um, and so having the proper enforcement to make sure that the regulations, whatever they may ultimately be, are enforced is something that we'll also be looking at very closely. And I guess lastly, um, I will tell you that even though we have these neat categories of class one, class two, and class three e-bikes, well, first of all, there is a whole lot of other e-vehicles out there. You may have seen E1 wheels. Um, just as a funny story, I was downtown this week and saw someone ride an E1 wheel and they had strapped a chair to it. Um, it was very strange to see that in downtown Colorado Springs. Uh, but we know that there's a lot of vehicles that are not appropriate for our natural areas. And how do we craft a rule that takes that into account? Um, as well as the fact that it's my understanding that e-bikes can be modified by the users to avoid some of those design parameters like the maximum miles per hour. Um, so there's a lot of interesting nuances to the e-bike story. This is kind of the very beginning of it. The city has been looking at it very closely, as has the county, as has we at Palmer. And so you will be hearing more about it. If I had to leave you with anything, I would say, it seems to me that there is kind of a near uh, universal consensus that e-bikes are certainly allowed on our urban trails, our commuting trails, um, our hard surface trails, and really the more difficult issues are, are where uh, are they appropriate on those natural uh, trails, the foothills trails, and the areas where mountain biking is allowed. And we know that different jurisdictions are looking into this and coming up with different answers. So stay tuned because um, you'll be hearing more about e-bikes in the future. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, I know that I love e-bikes and it's such, such important information that you're sharing. Before we conclude today's event, I, a few folks have submitted some questions that I would like to take some time now to answer. That first question is, who has owned the land in which will be used for Avenger and SOAR? Was it privately owned, leased, or a combination? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, so for SOAR, it was a uh, privately owned mining claim. So it was owned by an individual who had decided uh, to put it up for sale. They didn't want it anymore. And um, so that was the opportunity to acquire it for uh, conservation and public open space purchase, uh, the purchase. So privately owned in that case. Um, and I will say, as, as just a side note, side note, all of the work we do is always voluntary conservation. So it is always working with a willing 
buyer, uh, willing uh, seller, we are the willing buyer to when we acquire um, land or water rights for that matter. It's always voluntary. In the case of SOAR, um, that was Avenger. In the case of SOAR, it's, um, it's a little more interesting. So the first focus with SOAR is actually all state land board land. And um, and that really came about because they happened to own a, a significant acreage, 80,000 acres adjacent to military bases or, or in areas like um, this big ranch east of Colorado Springs that are key flight training areas. So with our partners, we engaged in um, years of discussion and negotiation with the state land board to actually come up with a framework where the conservation partners could purchase land from the state land board for conservation purposes under this um, military partnership program that is SOAR. So that, that project is unique. Um, that's the state land board, although there will be some um, likely some acquisition or conservation easements on privately owned parcels that are adjacent to military bases as well. Again, it'll all be voluntary um, for any projects that we're involved in. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I have a second question that I can ask. How does Palmer collaborate with other organizations, government agencies, or private landowners? Yeah, uh, everything we do is a collaboration at the end of the day, truly. If you're looking at, um, say, a single conservation project, a single property where we're putting a conservation easement on a farm, say, that's a partnership with a private landowner. And again, that is always voluntary. Um, so that landowner has to want to engage in conservation, um, see how it benefits them and their family. And then it's a discussion between Palmer and that private landowner to come to um, a conservation consensus that is then ultimately captured in the conservation easement that we then hold in perpetuity and Steve's team uh, manages uh, for their conservation values and does the enforcement. Uh, partnerships with uh, peer organizations are also critical. I already talked extensively about SOAR. That is an equal partnership with the Nature Conservancy and the Trust for Public Land. Truly, we are stronger together working on that project. And we're all bringing different expertise, different relationships, um, just different connections to the table that ultimately make that project stronger through the partnership. Um, government entities we have an incredibly long history with, as Steve mentioned, 20 public parks and open spaces um, we have in our portfolio of conservation easements. Those are those are owned by various government entities, City of Colorado Springs, El Paso County, with Avenger, the City of Woodland Park. Um, and that is a partnership. We don't own the land, they own the land, but we help enforce the conservation values those partnerships are stronger, the better our relationship is, and the more we're working in partnership to achieve these mutual conservation objectives. Um, so truly, from my perspective, everything we do is a partnership with all sorts of different types of people and entities, because at the end of the day, conservation truly is what unites us all. And, and we have an incredible roster of um, fellow organizations and individuals who want to see conservation done and who we are happy to partner with. Thanks, Rebecca. I, I totally agree. We're stronger together. Um, I'm looking at time. Let's do one more question. What are the biggest challenges Palmer faces in your conservation efforts? This actually ties into uh, so much of what uh, Christy talked about as well, and that is people get this done, as I mentioned earlier, and we need more people involved in this effort. The more people care, the more we can truly scale this work to to be on an even playing field with the growth that we see you know we often ask ourselves how can we be more competitive in our region to make sure conservation has a seat at the table to make sure a critical property that might be up for sale um, that that we have a fighting chance at securing it for conservation we've been expanding our toolbox over the last couple of years to make sure we have more options available um honestly things like you know quicker access to to cash and capital so that we could potentially come in and buy a property faster we've lost deals because we couldn't act fast enough because we didn't have the funding to do so um 
But on top of that, you know, conservation uh, takes more than just the on the ground work. It takes policy and advocacy. Your votes for conservation matter, supporting things like the TOPS program in the city of Colorado Springs, which is funding for new open spaces, supporting efforts like city of Woodland Park, uh, uh, taking the big step of acquiring this property. It takes all of us, it takes all of our voices. And so the more people we can bring into the fold at Palmer for the greater effort of conservation of land and water, the 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 more work we can we can do. And we know we need to do it because that's what we've heard from all of you over the years. Thank you, Rebecca. And I'm looking at time, so I'm gonna, I know we had a couple questions come in. I'm going to, I think in our follow-up, we'll answer those. So be on the lookout for those. And thank you for everyone who submitted questions. Submit by, uh, by Engage and like that makes this event so much more enriching. So thank you. Um, and as we wrap up today's event, I wanna thank all y'all for being here today. Our journey to a Colorado where there's more land and there's more water for the benefit of people and nature is only possible by working together. Your dedication, your support, your passion and your um, just interest is the driving force behind everything that we do here at Palmer. So thank you. If you're new to Palmer, I wanna encourage you to stay connected on our events and our initiatives by following us on Facebook or Instagram at Palmer Land Co or subscribing to our email, um, our e-news on our website at palmerland.org. Thank you once again for being here today. It's been a privilege to share this time with you and, and I hope we can stay connected until next time. Thank you so much.